Fallout is coming to Magic the Gathering. In March of 2024, we're going to be getting four brand new Commander pre-constructed decks where every single card is either a brand new card or a reprint featuring artwork and flavor text from the Fallout universe. Now March is pretty far away still, but Wizards of the Coast gave us a sneak peek on some of the cards that we can look forward to in the upcoming set, along with the face commanders of each of the four pre-constructed decks and a description about each one of them. So I'm going to go over all the brand new cards and give my first impressions on all of them. Keep in mind, I've never played the Fallout games, so a lot of the references are going to go over my head. So let me know in the comment section what the lore implications of all these cards are. I'm just going to be focusing on the mechanics. So we begin with the first face commander, and that is Dogmeat Ever Loyal. And you can see the new showcase frame that's going to be coming with the set as well. It's just like this cool like HUD type uh, style artwork. They also come with uh, regular art as well too. So this is going to be the face commander of the Naya pre-constructed deck. This is a Naya commander. It's a red, green, and white. So three mana, three, three legendary creature Dong. And it has two abilities. It says when Dogmeat enters the battlefield, mill five cards and return an aura or equipment card from your graveyard to your hand. And whenever a creature you control that's enchanted or equipped attacks, create a junk token. Now a junk token is a brand new card type that is unique to this set. It is an artifact token that you can tap, sacrifice, and then uh, exile the top card of your library and you can play it this turn and you can only activate it at sorcery speed. So junk sounds incredibly powerful. Of the artifact token producers we have these days, I would say treasure is on top and then junk and then probably maybe like blood and then clue and then food. Um, I think there might be other ones as well that I'm missing. But yeah, junk seems incredibly powerful. Being able to cast spells for no additional activation fee is really, really good. Um, so this is a, a really strong build around. And Dogmeat kind of shows you what this deck is all about. It's actually all about tokens. So in this case, it makes a lot of junk tokens. And it also uh, marries the token aspect of the deck to auras and equipment. So if you like aura and equipment decks and you want to spice it up with tokens, Dogmeat is going to be the precon that you're going to be interested in. The next face commander is the Wise Mothman. This is a soul type precon that focuses on different type of counters and it introduces a brand new counter type. So first let's read the card and then I'll talk about the new mechanic. So this is a four mana Saltai 3-3 legendary creature insect mutant. It has flying and whenever the wise, uh, the wise mothman enters the battlefield or attacks, each player gets a rad counter. And a rad counter is radiation. It's a new mechanic that's coming with fallout um, and you basically get what is on the right side over here, radiation. At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, if you have any rad counters, mill that many cards. For each not land card milled this way, you lose one life and a rad counter. So giving everybody radiation is a way of milling everybody and also damaging them a little bit. Then whenever one or more non-land cards are milled, put a plus one plus one counter on each of up to X target creatures where X is the number of non-land cards milled this way. So the Mothman wants everybody to be milled. It's not specifically to mill them out as a win condition, but it's utilizing the act of milling in a beneficial way. In this case, it's putting plus one plus one counters on creatures. Um, so this deck is all about counters. It cares about rad counters. It cares about plus one plus one counters. It cares about other counters as well. Um, it also cares about like the mutants and the weird uh, creatures you can find in the Fallout universe. And it also cares about proliferating, adding more counters to everything of the same type. So the Wise Mob Mount looks really cool. I think the radiation mechanic is really fun too. It's not too complicated, uh, but it is fun. And being able to mill and get value out of milling and not necessarily having to win off of milling is just a fun uh, design space. The next face commander is Caesar Legion's Emperor. This is the Mardu face commander. It's a four mana uh, Mardu 4-4 four, four, legendary creature human soldier. And it says whenever you attack, you may sacrifice another creature. When you do, choose two. Create two 1-1 one, one red and white soldier creature tokens with haste that are tapped and attacking. You draw a card and you lose one life. Or Caesar deals damage equal to the number of creature tokens you control to target opponents. So this is just a go wide attacking aggressive creature deck. You want to uh, squad up, make as many tokens on the battlefield as possible, creature tokens as possible, and then just attack with them. And then you get value out of attacking with them. So this is the aggressive um, precon 
of the lineup here. And it looks sweet. It's very straightforward. It has some flexibility over here. Sometimes if you don't have a lot of creatures, you can just draw some cards. Or if you want to sacrifice for value, you can make more creatures. And then eventually when you have a lethal amount of creatures, uh, Caesar can start just doming people to the face to finish them off. Everything here looks very reasonable, and it also combos infinitely with Breath of Fury, which is also oh fun. The final commander, though, is my personal favorite. This is Dr. Madison Lee. This is a Jeskai precon leader. It's a 2-3 legendary creature human scientist, and says whenever you cast an artifact spell, you gain an energy counter. So that's right, this is the first ever commander that actually cares about energy counters, which is very exciting. This is your first energy commander, and it may Carries uh, energy to artifacts, which makes a lot of sense. Um, energy was first introduced in Kaladesh, and there was, that was an artifact set. So energies and counters kind of go well together already. And she comes with three different abilities. You can pay uh, one uh, energy. Target creature gets plus one plus O and gains trample and haste until end of turn. Or you can tap her and pay three energy to draw a card. Tap her to pay four, uh, five energy. Return target artifact card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. This is a great payoff. So you want to be an artifact deck. You want to cast as many artifact spells as possible to generate as much energy as possible. And then her payoffs for energy is actually really good. Each of these abilities are highly relevant, uh, giving trample and haste, it's deal some more damage, uh, drawing cards, recursion. These are all great things. On a three drop commander, uh, this is very aggressively costed. I really like this. I'm very excited to build around Dr. Madison Lee. We have other legendary creatures though that aren't the face commander, but they're going to be in the 99 of commander decks and you can build commander decks around them. So the first one is Mr. House, president and CEO. This is a Mardu commander, three mana, zero, four, legendary artifact creature, human. And it says whenever you roll four uh, or higher, create a three, three colorless robot artifact creature token. If you rolled six or higher, instead create that many tokens and a treasure token and you can be four mana tap it roll a six sided die plus an additional six sided die for each mana from treasures spent to activate this ability so this is kind of a payoff for a roll deck so Baldur's Gate had a lot of uh, dice rolling mechanic infinity had dice rolling mechanics so a couple sets have had dice rolling mechanics at this point as well too uh, this one can uh, generate creatures and also treasures both artifacts as well so kind of like a uh, treasure deck slash uh, roll deck slash artifact deck. It looks cute. Um, it's a good, very efficient payoff for what it's trying to do is just three mana again. And it can kind of also uh, play into itself with an activated ability if you have the extra mana to spare. So it's fun. Next we have a dog. A legendary dog. This is Rex, Spy Cyber Hound. This is a three mana Azorius 2-2 two -two legendary artifact creature robot dong. Uh, whenever Rex deals combat damage to a player, they mill two cards and you get two energy. Um, then you could pay two energy, choose target creature card in a graveyard, exile it with a brain counter on it, exile only as a sorcery, and Rex has all activated abilities of all cards in exile with brain counters on them. So this is kind of an energy payoff. Uh, but in a weird way, I feel like this is going to just be a combo commander. It looks like the type of card that you just want to put some combo pieces in your graveyard and then combo off of Rex, like a Necrotic Ooze style deck, for example. Um, so maybe that is going to be how it's going to be built. I, I assume that's going to be the strongest way to build it. I don't know any combos off the top of my head. Um, I personally am not very interested in combo commanders as much as the tacky commanders, so this one doesn't interest me as much, but it is a legendary robot dog, which wins a lot of brownie points in my opinion. And then we have a bunch of non-legendary creatures that are going to be part of the 99 and just kind of uh, flesh out the flavor and the world building of Fallout. So first we have Over Encumbered. This is a two mana, a white enchantment aura. It says enchant opponent. When Over Encumbered enters the battlefield, enchanted uh, opponent creates a clue token, a food token, and a junk token. And at the beginning of combat on enchanted opponent's turn, that player may pay one for each artifact they control. If they don't, creatures can't attack this combat. So if you enchant an opponent with lots of artifacts, it's going to be very difficult for them to ever be attacking. However, you are going to be generating a decent amount of value for them no matter what. You're giving them a clue, you're giving them a food, and you're giving them a junk. So that's card advantage and mana advantage that you're giving them. 
um, but they cannot attack very easily um, if they are an artifact deck. If they're not an artifact deck, then they have to pay three if they don't crack any of the tokens that you gave them. But I mean, they're incentivized to cracking the tokens because the tokens are very good. Um, so it's not very good unless you're targeting an artifact player. And even then, it seems kind of weak because you're also giving them resources at the same time. So... I don't know. I don't think this card is very good, but it is very evocative of the flavor of having too much uh, stuff in your inventory, too much weight in your inventory, and not being able to really move around. So that's really cool. Next, we have my personal favorite card of the entire set so far, of the preview card so far. Uh, this is Radstorm. This is a four mana blue instant, and it has just two words, Storm and Proliferate. I mean, it also has the uh, explanation of the rule text, but Storm Proliferate, very cute, uh, very simple, but straight to the point. Uh, this is a really efficient way of putting a ton of counters, proliferating a ton of times on a single turn. Uh, it's one of the most efficient ways of doing it, actually. Um, it is a storm spell, so like if you just cast it by itself, you're only going to proliferate one time. If you uh, cast another spell before that, or if anybody casts another spell before that, you get to proliferate twice, and then that's basically almost worth it. And then if you get to like proliferate three times or more, Radstorm becomes very, very good. And what I really like is that it's instant speed, so that means you can actually utilize your opponent's turn of casting spells uh, to wait until your opponent casts all their spells this, on a single turn, then you rad storm, and then you get to copy it a bunch of times as well too, very mana efficiently. Uh, so I really like this card. I think this card can see a lot of play in basically any style of counter deck. It could be Infect, it could be Planeswalkers, it could be plus one, plus one counters, Energy, Rad, uh, whatever. It's gonna be really, really fun and I can't wait to get my hands on it. Next we have Alpha Deathclaw. This is a six mana Golgari 6-6 six, six creature lizard mutant. Um, it says Menace Trample. And it says, when Alpha Deathclaw enters the battlefield or becomes monstrous, destroy target permanent. And for seven mana, you can give it monstrosity four. So you put four counters on it, so it becomes a 10 10. And then when it becomes monstrous, you get destroy target permanent. This is a lot of mana. This is a six mana, six six. But that ETB trigger is really, really good. Destroying target permanent, it's like a pumped up acidic, uh, acidic ooze, acidic slime. One of those two. And then you get to do it again too if you have enough mana laying around. Obviously, it's not great in every like random Golgari deck, but a deck that cares about, you know, plus one, plus one counters maybe has ways of just dumping a lot of mana into mana sinks like the Alpha Death Claw. It could be really, really good. Uh, decks that really care about creatures over any other type and you want to find ways to destroy permanence on an ETB creature, that's this is a, a great option of that too. So not, not like a staple or anything, but very good in specific decks. Next, we have a card that is amazing in a very specific deck. This is Nuka-Cola Vending Machine. It's a three mana colorless artifact. You can pay one and tap it to create a food token. And whenever you sacrifice a food, create a tapped treasure token. So in a food deck, you're gonna be sacrificing food for a bunch of different things. Either just basic, your bog standard life gain, but you can also be sacrificing them to croc line ironworks to uh, generate a ton of mana or whatever. It's their artifact, their artifact tokens. You can sacrifice them a billion different ways. And then just being able to passively make treasure tokens off the sacrifice food is very, very good. Obviously, tapped means it slows down combo potential or limits the combo potential of this card. There's still going to be combo potential of this card. And it's also kind of just like a weaker academy uh, manufacturer, but still even a weaker academy manufacturer in a food deck is gonna be still freaking amazing. Uh, so this card is just, yeah, amazing in a food deck. It's a slam dunk uh, staple. Next, we have a Saga. This is Vault 101 Birthday Party. This is a four mana Saga. Uh, has three chapters. Chapter one says create a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token and a food token. Chapter two and three say you may put an aura or equipment card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield. If an equipment is put onto the battlefield this way, you may attach it to a creature you control. 
So this is an interesting way to make two tokens on the first uh, chapter. They're not like, that's not super exciting or anything. And then chapter two and three allow you to best case scenario, get something from your graveyard and put it directly back onto the battlefield. So it's recursion uh, plus ramp in a sense, uh, like mana advantage and card advantage in a way. Um, or you could cheat something from your hand onto the battlefield if you don't have any good uh, recursion targets. So it's more flexible, which is really nice. Um, and obviously, the bigger the aura or equipment mana value wise uh, it is, the more value you're getting out of the mana advantage of this ability because you get to put it onto the battlefield for free and you equip it for free as well too. So in the right deck, in the right aura slash equipment deck, I think this card is going to be pretty sweet. Uh, it's not like a staple in an aura equipment deck, but uh, it's just really solid. It's a solid card and could be very good in certain decks. Next, we have... V-A-T-S, or VATS. Uh, this is a four mana black instant at split second. Love to see split second. Uh, for people who don't know what this is, as long as this spell is on the stack, players can't cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. And then it says, choose any number of target creatures with equal toughness. Destroy the chosen creatures. So this can kill multiple creatures at instant speed and at split seconds, your opponents can't even respond to this ability by tapping things or sacrificing or countering it, for example. Um, so this card has a very, very swingy um, power level. It has a very low power floor, like you're just going to kill one thing for four mana, which is awful. <laughs> uh, but it has an incredibly high power ceiling where you'd like decimate entire armies and bypass any instant speed responses like counter spells or anything so it's really weird and really hard to uh, gauge the power level just eyeballing it you kind of have to play with it and see if it's good and obviously game by game it's either going to be doo-doo or amazing so it's a very exciting card very unique and i'm excited to try it out into shiro i don't think it's very good overall but it is an exciting card and i love playing with exciting cards Next, we have Intelligence Bobblehead. This is a three mana colorless artifact bobblehead. You can tap it to add one mana of any color, or you can tap it uh, five mana and tap it, draw X cards where X is a number of bobbleheads you control. So I'm assuming this is going to be a cycle of bobbleheads where each one is going to be a three mana, three, three, tap to add one mana of any color, and then it's gonna have a different activated ability uh, depending on what attribute bobblehead it is. So this one draws cards because of intelligence, I assume, and the other ones are going to do other things. Um, so this is kind of cool. Uh, this is kind of, uh, kind of wants you to add additional bobbleheads into your deck. So to load up on bobbleheads, that's a unique design space. I don't think it's very strong, but uh, making a bobblehead deck is actually very cool. And it's not legendary, so it's pretty easy to clone it as well. So if you make a bunch of copies of the bobbleheads, then it can actually get quite good. But it's cute. Uh, it's a fun build around. I don't think it's very strong, but it's a very casual fun. Next, we have Feral Ghoul. This is a three mana black 2-2 two -two creature zombie mutant. It has menace. And whenever another creature you control dies, put a plus one plus one counter on Feral Ghoul. And when Feral Ghoul dies, each opponent gets a number of rag counters equal to its power. So this is like a nice aristocrats uh, card. It has menace, so it's a little bit of evasion. It grows fairly quickly as you're sacrificing your other creatures for value. And then when it dies, your opponents are gonna be milled and lose a bunch of life. So I think overall that's pretty fun. Uh, again, for aristocrat payoffs, uh, there's so many competing cards over there, but it fits very well with the Sultai precon deck that's all about counters. So it gets a lot of counters on it, uh, plus one plus one counters and eventually puts rad counters on stuff and it's a, a big beater and a late game finisher for the deck which is cool next we have gary clone this is a two mana white one three creature human citizen and has squad two and squad was a mechanic that was introduced uh, in the Warhammer precons, and it's coming back here. As an additional cost to cast a spell, you may pay two mana any number of times. When this creature enters the battlefield, create that many tokens that are copies of it. So it's basically a kicker, a very specific type of kicker. I guess every mechanic is kicker, thus so that doesn't really help. But basically, you pay two additional mana as you're casting it uh, to make additional 
token copies of it. So you can play it early game and it's kind of like meh, but it does scale mid to late game as more as you have more and more mana. So whenever Gary Clone attacks, each creature you control named Gary Clone gets plus one plus O oh until end of turn. So it starts off like for two mana, it's basically unplayable, I think. So you really want to cast it for like four mana at least. And then they're going to be like three threes. Um, but yeah, it's, the more mana you can pump into this, the, the better it gets. So uh, yeah, this is a cool late game finisher for the Mardu deck. And obviously you have so many copies of these. You can start sacrificing them to Caesar to get additional value other ways. Um, so yeah, it goes, it goes wide. It deals with tokens. It's a finisher. It's fun. And then the final brand new revealed card was Idolized, which I think is like attributes you choose in character selection in Fallout when you're making your character. So I I think there are going to be like a cycle of auras that show off different type of attributes you can select for your character. But anyway, Idolized is a two mana white enchantment aura, enchant creature, and enchanted creature says... Uh, whenever this creature attacks alone, it gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of non-land permits you control. So you enchant the creature, and whenever it attacks by itself, it gets really, really big. Like, this obviously works best in, like, a token deck. Uh, any deck that can generate a bunch of permits on the battlefield as efficiently as possible. So, like, a food deck, a clue deck, a treasure deck, a, even just, like, a plus one, a one, one creature token deck. Any any type of tokens. Uh, you can flood the board with, with uh, a lot of tokens, uh, permanents, and uh, Idolize gets really, really big in that sense. So, this is kind of nice to slap onto your commander, especially if it has evasion in that style of deck, and then you just, like, one-shot people. Um, yeah, this card... Is very mana efficient. It's very specific in where it wants to be, but it's very good at what it's trying to do. So yeah, that's all of the brand new Fallout cards that were previewed um, yesterday. And uh, there were also uh, reprints with brand new Fallout artwork and flavor text and all that um, stuff. So if you want to see all of that, head on over to mtgpreviews.com. Uh, all of them are over there. And if there are any other Fallout cards that are going to be previewed, uh, you will see them all there as well. So that's it, everyone. I'm going to be back soon with some Budget Commander content. So check that out shortly. And until then, friends, see ya.